When, when Dr. Adriana and Dolores asked me about if I want to talk about the models, I wasn't sure if I am the right person to talk about it. The reason is that I do not develop models. I do not create models. I use models to actually help farmers, help uh, producers to be more efficient. And that's what I really want to talk with you about for the next 45 minutes, to basically share some of our experiences that, well, we'll see if you can relate to, and then we, maybe hopefully we'll have some time to talk about maybe some questions. Uh, Dollars already mentioned, uh, I am from Pennsylvania, originally I'm from Poland. I've been in uh, Pennsylvania for more than 28 years, more than 30 years in the United States. Uh, Pennsylvania is a relatively small state, but we are number one, number four in apple production, we are number five in peach production, uh, in the top ten with grapes and so on. Uh, our orchards are very diverse, and again, I mean, majority of them right now look like they should look like. I'm trying to figure out which one would be that. Uh, our orchards are, you know, peach orchards, uh, not a very high density, but we're going there. Apple orchards, anywhere from, I don't know, uh, seven, six, seven hundred trees to fifteen hundred trees per hectare. And it varies. We have old orchards, we have orchards that are 50 years old, and we have a lot of new plantation. So we have about plus minus uh, 1,500 fruit growers. Uh, those fruit growers, they have to deal with a lot of insects. And again, uh, I'm using the English names for the insects. I thought it would be easier to relate than all the Latin names. But the point of this slide is the complex is very large. We, when you are a fruit grower, you have to deal with many different insect pests at any given time does not mean that all the time every grower has to work on all of them. But they are group that basically every year growers have to be aware of and actually monitor a lot of more. The six that I would say the most important for us are Canotrachelus nenuphar, it's a weevil, codling moth, Oriental fruit moth, one of our leaf rollers, uh, apple maggot, which is kind of similar to your fruit flies, and of course, Haliomorpha halis. And you know, we spend a lot of time talking about Haliomorpha, and this will not be the topic. Because uh, we're talking about models, I think the one that we should talk about are actually codling moth and oriental fruit moth. And that's what I will concentrate, but we can go to any other pest. Uh, when we're talking about models, uh, each of those pests from the previous slide or two slides back, all of them had their own model. And they are not exactly the same based on the same threshold or something like this. So, we really have to be aware that at least in our conditions, it might be different for you, a model or the model for codling moth will not work for oriental fruit moth, will not work for haliomorpha, and will not work for something else. But there is a model for oriental fruit moth, for grafolita, and there is a model more or less useful for Haliomorpha. 
So I'm just saying this so we are aware that when we use the word models, we have to be aware that realistically, at least in our condition, I will be talking about individual past. Most of our models start with the biofacts. Uh, depends who you talk to. Some people will tell you that, oh, you don't have to have a biofix. You know what a biofix is, I'm assuming. Biofix is the first day of continuous catch of moths in the pheromone traps. That's how we define our biofix. Some people, especially on the West Coast in US, they will tell you, you don't need a biofix. You can start the model on January 1st and then keep accumulating the grid days and it will actually work for you. Well, I'm showing this data, and this is data actually from uh, 2000 to 2015 for Carpocapsa, for codling moth. And it's not that the dates here are different. What I think is important here is that this is the grid days, and I'm sorry, my degree days will be in Fahrenheit. Okay, so this, you cannot relate to them directly, but I use them as an example. Uh, the biofix can happen at anywhere from 220 degree days to 360 degree days. And those are the real biofix in the field. If we accumulate degree days from January 1st, it might be a big difference. In addition, of course, uh, the flight is, well, <laughs> complicated. Uh, Pomonella, Cydia Pomonella flight. In US, we would say we have, at least in Pennsylvania, we would say we have two and a half generation of codling moth. Does this graph actually represent two and a half generations? Uh, this is data from four season, and that's how different the flight is depending from the year. The data was collected from the same orchard on the weekly basis. Uh, we do have a model that actually predicts egg hatch, and so you have the flight, you have the models, models tells you that they are free generation. Uh, the point is, the reason I'm saying that there is a problem is that theoretically this is the first generation, this is the second generation, or maybe a third generation. And even for codling moth, we are not sure how to look at this. The grid days in the model telling us we have three generations. Uh, Biofix for the oriental fruit moth, uh, they are different threshold but the same situation. They can start at 190 or at 340. So again, there is an issue here. If you don't, if you just don't want to put traps out and you say, let's go because January 1st is a great date and there is an 80% chance that between that everything will happen on certain time and that's where the model should start, uh, you might be a few weeks off. Grafolita molesta, grafol flight and egg hatch models, that's what we see in the orchards and that's what the models tells us. This is the, again, this is the egg hatch model. Why am I con uh, concentrating on the egg hatch model? Because those models for us are the ones that we hope growers can use. And since the larvae are the ones that we're trying to protect fruit from, we don't care if the adults are flying there. We are worried that we have to control the larvae. And we have to be very precise because for both, cognitive moth and oriental fruit moth, if we don't control the larva within let's say 24 hours, sometimes it's 12, sometimes it's 36, but if we don't control the larva within that time after hatch from the egg, 
the larva will be inside the fruit. And when the larva is inside the fruit, doesn't matter what we do, we cannot do anything. We will not be able to manage, we will not be able to control. Uh, this is the data from uh, specifically from 2017, 2018. The red one are the flight. This is for oriental fruit moth. And those are the egg hatch models, how they supposed to, when we supposed to control. And sometimes they overlap pretty nice. This is 2018, this is 2017. And sometimes it's like we have a very high flight here, but the egg hatch is telling us that no, we don't really have to do anything because, well, they are not hatching. So I put this overlay between the egg hatch model and the actual flight to show you that if we don't pay attention to what is actually happening in the orchards, the models might be misleading. I'm not saying wrong, I'm saying misleading. Uh, our recommendation for the farmers are based on the egg hatch models. We basically say, and this is for oriental fruit moth, the red line, and this is for codling moth, that at so many degree days, and again, everything is in Fahrenheit, after of the first generation, that's when growers are supposed to apply insecticides that will be effective. This is about 5-10% egg hatch. So this is to control first generation, second, third, and fourth. This is for codling moth. For codling moth, for carpocapsa, we recommend two applications, one at 5, one at about 50-55% egg hatch. The reason why we believe that, you know, we have to let the fi first 5% go because you cannot control 100% of everything. I mean, controlling 100% of everything is practically impossible. And you can see this based on the flight. But the point is that when we talk to our growers, we are talking about the models. We're talking about egg hatch models. And we're telling them when the application is supposed to happen to be the most effective based on the egg hatch models. And they are different for oriental fruit moth. Those timings for are different than they are for codling moth. And in our apple orchards, we have both. We have codling moth and oriental fruit moth feeding on apples. Almost the same level. There were times that we had more injuries from oriental fruit moth. There are times that more from uh, codling moth, but both of them are affecting fruit. If you look generally on this developmental degree days accumulation, it seems like those years, this is 2019, 18, 17, 15, 14, those lines developed by the model are very tight, very close, no problem. They really seem to very well develop. The problem starts when you really start looking exactly what is happening. Again, this is Carpocapsa. And the difference here is really this time period and this time period. So this is about this 5-10% egg hatch. This is the, based on the model, how they were flying. And our recommendation, 5 to 10% egg hatch in uh, 2015 happened about May 19. The same 5 to 10% egg hatch in 2020 happened in June. It's very important to remember this. I still think the models are accurate here. But again, if you are a grower, when you are an apple grower, you think about calendars. You think about first week, second week, stuff like this. And again, the timing, recommended timing, when the 5 to 10% egg hatch, one year, it will be in the mid-May. The other year, it will be beginning of June. This is the second application for Carpocapsa. And then again, 7th of June or 15th of June. That's why when we use anything that help us, 
to be more effective, we really have to look what is actually happening in the orchard. We can't just rely on the data that is provided by some generalization. I mean, this whole talk is to basically tell you that we have to be very particular to particular location because models are generalization which are correct and they are excellent for certain purpose. But if you take into account that each species has a different model and each orchard within certain area actually is exposed to different weather conditions, working in one or the other orchard is not necessarily required the same activities. Um, those are the examples of the, what, they, what we US we call the pest management decision, decision support options. This is from University of California. This is from Washington State. And this is from our area uh, from the Northeast United States. Again, uh, you have the links here. So you can go and play with this. I will really concentrate on this area because that's where Pennsylvania is. Uh, starting from the late 90s, our growers had the access to what we called Skybit models. And again, you don't have to worry what is written here. This is the example what every grower who wanted could get. In the 90s, there was by fax. In the 2000s, it came by the email. But there was a company, private company, and they were sending to the growers the weather information, the insect model, and disease model. Uh, for growers, it was important because the weather one was telling them the forecast and the summary for the last seven days. How it, how it was important? Well, this was the forecast. And at the time, we actually learned that the most important for the growers was this column, wind speed. You see the difference? And there are limits. So this is a model that actually worked for us from mid-90s until about uh, 2018-2019. Why the stop? Because bigger company bought that company and it disappeared. We don't know why. We don't, it just stopped providing this kind of service to the farmers. We could not get it. But anyway, so this is the general data. It includes forecast. It includes seven day past, uh, the insect model, that's how the whole page look like. Again, I'm not trying to ask you to read anything. The important part is that the data on each page was for the whole month. We have those most important pest species, Graffolita molesta, codling moth, this leaf roller, another leaf roller, leaf miner, apple maggot, based on the biofixes for those different species, the piece of paper was providing how, when the egg hatch models. So let's say June 6, we were at 52% egg hatch for codling moth, 2% for tufted, oriental fruit moth, there were no hatch, and so on. So growers had to make their own decision. This model didn't tell them what to do, but tell them where are we within the season, within the flight. So this is the, how it looked like. And then at the end of the page, it also provides the forecast, which basically tells them, you know, this is the oriental fruit moth. And now you see that oriental fruit moth is active, hatching, codling moth is not. This one is over. So it's like, it was very simple. Piece of paper, grower can read if he or she understands what the numbers meant, they could act. And their activity were very effective. But again, this company disappeared. So now 
we have a different system which is called NUA. And this one actually encompasses not only Pennsylvania, but entire northeast of United States. And again, I apologize for the size of it, but I was trying to show you the whole screen view. So it's not important what is it, but basically, if I am a grower in Pennsylvania, I can go to this website, find the nearest weather station. You can have the weather station on your farm, if you are large enough, or you can use weather station that is nearest location to your farm. It can be airport, it can be some other grower weather station, can be university, many different places. And then you still, and then you go to the new website, and then you log in and check what you want to look at. Uh, for apples, they have disease programs, they have pest programs, they have horticultural programs. Let's say this is uh, for oriental fruit, this is for oriental fruit moth, this is for codling moth. So, for oriental fruit moth, here, you have biofix for the first generation, you have the biofix for the second, you have biofix for the third. You would ask how they're getting those numbers, those dates. Grower provides them. Because they provide you with the numbers, but the chance is that their numbers are off. For our location, where I am located in uh, Pennsylvania, we are based, the model is usually off for about seven to eight days. Seven, well, five to eight days. But, knowing the biofix, I can enter my own biofix, and then the model recalculates itself, and then we know exactly for our orchard, based on the weather, the temperature, the humidity, and on our own biofix. And then, it provides you this information, you know, there is a date, and then what percent egg hatch, how many degree days is accumulated, and then what the pest stages. And this model, again, it's a new version of it, also provides you the IPM recommendation. It's not being sent to you, but you can go, log in, get all this information, you can make it specific to your farm, it works. But again, the whole thing is that it works as long as you provide it with the accurate data. And the accurate data is on your own monitoring. And again, this is the example that this is from January 1st, the grid days for codling mode. Those are the, from the biofix for that location. And this is from the second generation when codling mode started. So again, it's like, you can manipulate, get the information you need to be more precise in whatever you're planning to do with, the, with those information. I keep talking about it, but this is the slide that I made, I don't know, probably 15 years ago. And this is from our organic orchard. But the point is, having traps in the orchard is not an option. I mean, you cannot do anything in the orchard if you don't monitor the orchard, the particular site, particular location. And here comes the first challenge that I see. We do have a lot of different traps, and I will not going to show the data about it, but not all of those traps are equal, equally catching moths. You know, we have the photo traps, that's our version, you guys have the, your own version. We have the light traps, we have the regular pheromone traps, we have the Z traps, which actually use the electric current and count the moth, send you the information, you know, there's a lot of technological advance right now, how the traps can work, but at this moment I'm not sure 
that all the data that we're getting from those traps are exactly the same every time. This is the example of the Z trap and the information, the location. You know, you get the software, it tells you how the data is changing. Again, very nice thing, but with a lot of limits. Uh, the photo traps, something similar that you guys already have here, different company, but it doesn't matter. The regular delta trap, camera, take the photo, send to server, you can actually see what you're catching. It's very simple. It works. And I like this one the most because I believe this one is the closest one to our standard delta traps that we use for the, I don't know, 30 plus years. But here comes another issue. At least in our case, we do have multiple lures to monitor the same species. And I'm not even talking that there are differences in the pheromone load among different lures from different companies. The same company also might have a different lures with a different component. For oriental fruit moth, we have in common use, OFM combo dual lure, which basically we say you can use this lure in orchard with mating disruption for oriental fruit moth. We have OFM long lasting, which basically means this lure can be used for 12 weeks without exchanging. And OFM lure, which is have exactly the same pheromone in it but this one only lasts for four weeks. And now the issue is how the capture from those diff the, the same trap, but baited with the different lure, actually compare. What is the correlation? Well, in no mating disruption orchard, when we compare the L2 lure with L2 combo dual lure, we had a pretty good, in no mating disruption, pretty good correlation. 0 0.8 is, I think, something that I wish we always get something like that. But you start going to orchard with one kind of mating disruption. This is actually a spryable pheromones. The same lure, the same lure, the correlation is much lower. And then there is another kind of mating disruption, different product that is being used for mating disruption, and correlation is almost not existing. So what to use and how to feed those models? Uh, Codlink moth is even more interesting. Those are the common pheromone lures that we have for, that can be used in the orchards. Again, it's only apples because codling moth doesn't affect stone fruit. You have the regular lure, the long lasting lure, the combo lure, the combo extra lure, lure that doesn't that have only those extra pieces, and then you have this lure that actually does not include pheromone. This is the lure that actually has only four chiromone included in it which means catch males and females. But again, those are commercial lures. If you are a grower, well, you just go and buy the codling moth lure. Depends which one you ask for, well, you can get different one. How the correlation look like? This is the L2P, this is the regular lure. 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, okay? So it's very important, whatever we use, to be careful what we feed the models with. Because models are great, however, they are only as good as the data that we feed them on so we can get the output from it. This is something that I really want to stress, and I'm not saying that this is not 
that this is a situation that cannot be solved, cannot be corrected or something like this. But I'm saying with all those diversity between the traps and the lures, we really have to be careful what and how we use it. And then there is another piece to this whole equation, mating disruption. Again, just different example of mating disruption. Uh, this is the slide telling you how many different products we tested in different years, basically from two to five, six, seven different mating disruption products over the time, different companies, and we play with the mating disruption only for codling moth or oriental fruit moth or for both. They are different products. And growers can use any one of them because all of them are registered. So now I'm going to give you a practical example what is happening in those different orchards. Uh, this is a slide from 2001. And again, I had to remove a lot of slides because I didn't try to fit it within the time frame I had. But this is the trap capture from one of the orchards where we had mating disruption. But the, those are the insecticide application that growers made by themselves. They knew the data and they decided when they're going to spray. And those are the different timings that they spray those insecticides. You see that being fed with the same information does not cause the same reaction. This is the fruit injury. Because, you know, at the end of the day, doesn't matter how the trap data differ, grower wants to have a clean fruit. And those are the different mating disruption programs that those different orchards had. And this is the mid-season at harvest fruit evaluation. And this is the percent of injured fruit. Having the traps, having mating disruption, spraying. This is the insecticide only, no mating disruption. But then you see that mating disruption actually helped, helped a lot, but two percent, one percent, seven percent, it's not acceptable from the grower perspective. And they had mating disruption in the orchard. What does it say? Well, not all mating disruption are equal. And I'm not going to go which one is better, which one is not, because this might differ, depends from the orchard location and so on. But I'm going to spend a little bit more time on the 2023 trial this past summer, when we actually tested six different combinations of mating disruption. There were only four products, but six different combinations and grower standard. You have the rates, you have the name of the product. Basically, we work with mostly with CBC and Tressa as our mating disruption supplier. That's how our trial look like usually. It's a one block. Different pieces of the block had different mating disruption. We try to have them side by side, so this way we have a continuous area of mating disruption. Sometimes it's possible, sometimes it's impossible. This one here was uh, plus minus 10, 12 hectares. One control, another control. This one here was continuous. Then we had those two treatments separated, surrounded by the orchards that do not have mating disruption. Oh, sorry. But that's basically how, when we're doing a field trial in grower orchards, under commercial situation, we have to deal with those kind of situations. So that's the different mating disruption. What I'm going to want you to look at is this is the trap data from those seven different treatments. Those are the names of the mating disruption. Standard, without mating disruption, and regular sex pheromone lure. That's the one that will last for 12 weeks. 
for 20 plus years, if I would have mating disruption and I would use this lure, this would be just a single line and then the standard will be the only line that will be above. Right now, and this is like happening for the last three, four years, despite using only sex pheromone lure, which using the same sex pheromone that is in the mating disruption, this lure is catching moths in the traps almost at the same level as it does in the standard block. This is the lure that does not have sex pheromone. This is the one that has those four chiromones. And this one is expected to look like this. But this one is not. So this is comparison with the different, the CMDAC lure. And again, this DAC lure should be catching moths in undermating disruption. But again, L2, it is the same as on the previous slide. And then a different ore chart, but exactly the same situation. Regular lure, different mating disruption, and catching a lot of moths, and this is for K lure. What is going on? What is happening here? We really don't know. Uh, this doesn't have any statistics on it. Those are just the raw numbers almost. But this is basically the fruit evaluation we did for codling moth, for oriental fruit moth, those seven treatments, different locations. And despite catching all those moths, there is really not a bad case of too many injured fruit. I think this standard without mating disruption that was the highest fruit injury at 0.5%. So mating disruption based on the traps seems not to be working, but in 23, we did not have a problem. I mean, growers don't want to see the 0.5, but I, I, I can accept it compared to the 7% or more previous years. So we're getting to the, last, to the last point that messing up the whole system, insecticides. Uh, again, this is the assortment of different insecticides currently registered in United States that have the codling moth and oriental fruit moth on their label. It does not mean that we recommend all of them or the growers would use all of them, but they do, but they are registered and they have codling moth or oriental fruit moth or both on the label. Our recommendation is basically use diamides and then you have within the diamide, you have Altacor, you have Verdeprim, you have Exerel, and then Volium Flexi, Minecto, or Besiege are actually a mix of those diamides plus either neonicotinoids or pyrethroids or abamectin. Then, and all of, but all of them, we group them in the group 24 because of the diamide. Spinosin, we have Delegate, and then we have the granulosis virus, which is another group. So those what we recommend at the moment for the growers to use to control codling moths. When we make this recommendation, we always pay attention to those three things. Timing, coverage, and effective product. When we use the model, the only thing that model help you with is the timing. And you can have a perfect timing, but if any one of those two will not be perfect, the product will not work. And we have to understand this because it seems like, oh no, we have the model, we know the timing, we have the insecticide or mating disruption, we go. Well, all three of them has to be perfect for growers to get 
satisfaction out of result. And then, this is the last, I think, three slides or four slides, the diamides. When they were introduced back in 2006-2008, uh, we did the baseline study. So we tested different population of codling moth and oriental fruit moth uh, for their sensitivity to renaxiper, to chloratraniliprol, when they never were exposed to those products before. Trying to establish the LC50, LC90, which I am assume you know that this is the lethal concentration to kill 50% of the tested population or 90% of tested population. And the difference with the most sensitive and the least sensitive were very small, uh, basically insignificant. And the daughter from Pennsylvania, this is the number of population from outside of Pennsylvania. Those numbers are identical, those are almost the same. And then in 2021, we got some problems that I didn't talk earlier, but we got some problems with some orchards that use those different diamides. And we had orchards that were basically exactly the same kind of numbers, LC50, LC90, as we had 12, 15 years earlier. But then we also found orchards that those numbers looked completely different. Uh, this is data from 22, from last year, when we collected number of population and did the bioassay again with Altacore, Chloratraniliprol, Exeril, Trianta Nitraniliprol, <coughs> Verdeprim, Cyclaniliprol, those three mixes, and then Delegate, which is a different group, that's the Spinoza. And LC50, this is the low means the most sensitive population, high mean the least sensitive population. And LC50 level, you see the differences. And LC90, those differences are even more pronounced. For delegate, those differences are basically not existing. And those numbers are basically the same as they were back in when they were introduced, 2007 or 2008. So those are the numbers. He adjusts the differences, the difference between the highest and the lowest for alta core, 28 fold difference in sensitivity, 145 at LC 50 sensitivity. Then you go to those mix, mixes. This is chloratraniliprol uh, plus thiamethoxam, which you guys don't use, but we still have it. Uh, Minecto, which is Tiantraniliprol, which is Exirel plus Avermectin, and then Besiege is the pyrethroid plus the Altacore. Those are the level of differences that we observe among those different populations. And what is happening is that we truly believe right now that we do have early stages of resistance to diamides in our orchards. In 23, uh, all the data from the 22 were actually originating from this county here only. A very, that was, I don't know, 20, I don't know, maybe 50 square kilometers area. Different growers, but one very small area. That's where we saw all those problems. So in 23, we still try to collect apples here, but we also went outside of this main fruit growing county to other location, trying to see if we can see this somewhere else. If this is such a localized or somewhere else also. And we're still in the process of analyzing this data. And we did not do all the bioassays yet because well, we didn't have enough time, but this is for delegate. And we don't see any differences 
among the population in the response to the spinetora. This is Spinoza. But this is Diamite group. Exactly the same what we have seen before. Those two are actually from the same area that was collected in 2020, 21, 22, and so on. So I can't tell you that we have a diamite resistance in Pennsylvania, widespread, but we do have population localized that growers, I'm basically telling them, don't use diamites. So this is the, really the last slide. And I was thinking, do, should I have a, you know, the summary of something? And I said, no, well, I decided no, because I want to hear from you what you think, what questions you might have, and so on. So that's, that's the people who work in my lab this summer, and hopefully will work in the future. Any questions? <laughs>